Welcome back, everyone, to Aspire, the Leadership Development Podcast, where we will be discussing the visions, inspirations, and experiences from top educational leaders. My name is Joshua Stamper, and you can connect with me on Twitter or on Instagram at Joshua double underscore Stamper. Welcome back, everyone, to the Aspire Podcast, and I'm so excited to have these two gentlemen on the podcast. I've got Zach Rondo and Grayson McKinney, the wonderful authors of the expert effect and i am holding the book it's amazing and i can't wait to dive into a bunch of different topics on project-based learning and going beyond the classroom teacher to find experts and then of course getting out to the authentic audience so gentlemen thank you so much for being on the podcast thanks for having us josh thank you so much it's truly an honor so gentlemen before we begin on all those wonderful topics i'd love to hear about your educational journey and i'm going to start with you zach Yeah. As a kid, I definitely didn't anticipate being a fourth grade teacher in my future or going into education. But as I went on in school, I come from a family of teachers. My mom and grandma started a daycare center in 1983, which my mom still owns and runs today. My aunts who are teachers as well. My grandparents were both teachers. I actually met teaching down the hall from each other in a public school. So kind of those roots just just came through. Um, and in college, I started going through the education program. And what really set my decision for me was that I worked at a day camp in the summers through college. And I was ended up being the director of the third and fourth grade day camp and realized that that was the age group I really liked working with. So then I went through my student teaching and into the job interview process, which was very long. But on one September day, the third day of school, I found myself going in to teach a sample lesson. So I walked into Grayson's classroom that day and taught a nonfiction text lesson. And I guess you could say it went well, because the next day we had classrooms next door to each other and we're teaching partners and the rest has kind of come from there. What about you, Grayson? Yeah, so I grew up on the west side of Michigan in East Grand Rapids, and I also am from an educational uh, family. My mom was a school social worker of 30 plus years, and uh, so I grew up going into schools with her being a part of all of those extracurricular fun, like the carnival nights and the the field trips and all those things, and grew up in the classrooms and knew that I wanted to be working with kids. I was given the chance to actually take on the role of a teacher in high school. We had a cadet teaching program, and they sent me over to the elementary school that I had gone to growing up, and where I got to volunteer in a fourth grade classroom. That way I knew by the time that I went off to college that that was something that I could see myself doing. I went to college at Western Michigan University, majored in elementary education and Spanish education, got to travel abroad and lived in Spain for a summer. And when I finally graduated, I ended up teaching a multi-age class of fifth and sixth graders for one year, was laid off repeatedly because of the, the times that we were in and rehired to build an elementary Spanish program as a, as a second language for an international baccalaureate school. And that what Awesome. I loved um, being able to do that curriculum design. And after four years, I moved to the district where I work currently, Troy School District, and have taught fourth and fifth grade there. And as Zach said, we uh, found each other teaching with each other down the hall, and it has gone well. We figured out that we had a lot in common, and we wrote a book about the experiences and the the system that we figured out together. And a lot has changed since those early days, uh, (laughs) hanging out in the classroom with my mom. So. (laughs) Well, that's awesome story that you both work together and and have seen how education has changed. And I think that's a great segue because within your book, you have a chapter called Changing the Rules of School. And I just want to know, you know, since your time from the beginning of your teaching career till now, what are some things that you identified that you really felt needed to change? Well, when I started, you know, the only thing you really know is what you experienced as a student. So it was a lot of worksheets. It was a lot of lecture. It's a lot of multiple choice tests, spelling lists every Monday, spelling tests every Friday. And like now that I think back to those things, like I don't most of those I I don't do anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's just kind of an evolution of thinking. And luckily, we have a very supportive school district who is, you know, challenged us to push the envelope and think of new ways and gives us permission to take risks and try new things. So now I'd say my classroom is much more project based. I don't assign homework every single night. I don't find that necessary for fourth grade students. So a lot of things have changed in the positive direction. I think back to my first year of teaching when I I told myself I was going to be so organized and I had a, you know, one of those double pull out drawers with the hanging folders and I had the transparency sheets. 
in order from first lesson to last lesson <laughs> and with like all of my transparency marker notes like written on it and I was going to use it the next year and you know I think a lot of people come out of teacher preparation programs thinking about teaching the content and you know being master of your content you have a bachelor's of science degree or and they th they think about the content but when you get into the classroom and you realize that you're interacting with human beings that e each come with their own unique set of needs and challenges and passions you have to find a way to tap into that and connect your curriculum to what they're interested in. And so, you know, looking back, I, I kind of shudder at the first couple of years uh, of teaching and like think, oh, my gosh, I wish I could have those kids again because you get in touch with the, the humanity of it and and less about the organization and rigid rigidity. Well, Grayson, I think everyone feels that way. I, I feel so bad for my students that I first had, and especially like the first three years I, I was drowning, but yeah. we all get better, right? We all learn through our experience. And, and that's amazing that you have reflected on that and then saw that there needed to be a change. And so with that change, you both talked about project-based learning. So for those who are listening and say, oh yeah, I've got project-based learning occurring in my classroom or at my school, it's more than just having your students do a project. So will you just kind of lay out what you gentlemen like to do within your class for project-based learning? Yeah, about three, maybe four years ago now, I was involved in this um, teacher leadership program and we had this two-day immersive project-based learning training that was like absolutely transformative for me as a teacher. Shout out to my Lily, if you're listening, who ran that and I still am in touch with. But first minutes were like, raise your hand if you do project-based learning. And I was like, Yes. And then very quickly realized that I did what in the book I refer to as PBL-ish. It was like part project-based learning, but a lot of it was doing a project at the end of a unit, like take a test and then let's do a fun project for a few days and then move on. But really what project-based learning is, is launching the unit with a driving question and letting that question or set of questions drive the learning of the entire unit and a product at the end of it results. Now, the biggest misconception we hear all the time with teachers is that project-based learning means you ditch all direct instruction. And that's simply not true. They can't create a project without having that prior knowledge. So you do still have direct instruction. It just comes in smaller chunks throughout the process. Um, and is a little bit more strategically planned than just 100% lecture based. Project-based learning also, I think, has the added benefit of, I'm doing air quotes right now, but they say the soft skills, it's baked into it. So all the things that we say are now, you know, 21st century learning, which really have always been important, but now people are beginning to know that they're more important, you know, critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, communication, global citizenship, all of these things, project-based learning, it gives you an authentic way for students to learn those skills, learn how they're applicable to working in groups or working in, you know, as a class. And then also gives them the chance to reflect on their learning and reflect in not only on the content, but seeing how they're growing as a learner. Um, so I think that project based learning has a lot of benefits beyond just yeah giving them a neat, you know, arts and crafts type thing to do at the end of a unit. It really it's a, a natural vehicle for those things that we want students to come out of their form formative K-12 uh, years with. So you talked about providing the prior knowledge of the unit. And I know when I went to school and probably for you gentlemen also, like the expert was the teacher when we were in the classroom. And it was that direct um, instruction that we got for 45 minutes, right? 90% of the class. Then you got the, like the last little bit to do your homework. And then whatever you didn't finish, you took home with you, right? Right. Where the model that you're stating is extremely different, but then also the way that students are getting knowledge is different. So what are some tactics that you're using to get knowledge beyond the classroom? Yeah, the first part in our system is getting students to learn from outside experts. So same thing you just said as when I was a kid, I remember like thinking that my teacher knew everything in the world. And they're the smartest people. And we do not need to put that kind of pressure on ourselves to know every single thing. We can leverage, especially with technology and in the past year and a half. I think everybody has been on Zoom and knows how to how to use it now. So we can leverage that technology where you can get either a community expert to come into your classroom. It could be a parent of a student, an aunt, an uncle, an entrepreneur in your community. If they're, they do something in their everyday job, in their life, that connects to what you're doing, why not pull them in and let them teach the students about it instead of us as teachers or reading out of a textbook or pretending we know what their day-to-day -day lives look like. It takes the pressure off of us. It makes it more more real and engaging for students to learn from an expert that's either there or on Zoom. 
So of course, we as teachers still hold the knowledge we still have to teach, but when possible, and when you get to know your curriculum really well, you know those kind of rabbit holes you can dive down and bring those experts in to, to help you out and to make the learning more exciting and engaging for students as well. Yeah, I'll add, you know, teachers absolutely are experts in themselves too. It's just that the the skill set and the the area in which we need to have that expertise is shifting slightly. We need to be experts in knowing our students. We need to be experts in knowing what they're interested in learning more about. Mm -hmm. We need to be experts in putting them in touch with the right people at the right time and being willing to step out of our own comfort zones and be able to say, I don't know about this, but as your teacher, I can help put you in touch with the person who is. I know we were going to talk a little bit at the end about an interesting summer school opportunity that Zach and I have been a part of for the last two weeks, um, but I, I think it's applicable right now. We, I've got a group of students who are very interested in video editing. And so uh, my teaching partner and I have been able to connect them with a film editor who has worked at Disney, Pixar, Marvel, Fox, he, you, like you name it, he's worked on it. And getting them to like learn about film editing and storytelling through film and, you know, choosing the right music from somebody who has, you know, traveled to New Zealand and worked on the Hobbit films. Like that's exciting for me as a teacher. I think one, one of the greatest things about our system is that the teachers are constantly learning too, and it makes it real for the kids and it, it gets them excited about it. So just one example, my brother also works at the University of Michigan and he's a he's in charge of uh, their multimedia studio audio recording and video video editing for the professors and students who have projects so um, we were able to have like an intimate conversation with him and you know bring him into the classroom and it's something that teachers have in in some regards always been doing through the booking of field trips and like you know having special speaker you know authors and illustrators come in we're just kind of like putting it as uh, the first step in our three-part system, because when they're learning from experts, then they get excited. They can become experts through that project-based learning. And then finally, third stage is teaching as experts, where they get to step into that role and help share the knowledge with the world. Yeah, I really like that. The connection that you guys are making to real-world professions and, and the problems that you're, you're posing. So is that something that you do with every single project, is that you pose a question that connects to a real-world issue? We try to, we try to, and not like, you know, I don't want to say that every single unit of every single subject turns into one of these magical project-based learning things. But when we do have these specific ones, like I always know when we learn about entrepreneurship, like the prescribed method would be to read like four pages in a textbook on Henry Ford to learn about entrepreneurship. But a real way we can do it is to actually, you know, leverage our networks and know friends who are entrepreneurs or family members or students, family members who are entrepreneurs. So we always want to kind of launch with a driving question that the learning builds on throughout the time. So break down a project for me. So what are some examples? Because you talked about entrepreneurship, you talked about media. What are some other things? Because I'm, I'm just imagining that someone's listening and like, this is a really cool concept. I've heard about project-based learning, but I haven't taken the jump into this. What are some examples that you can provide to the listeners on some projects that are tangible for them to implement into the classroom? I can give an example. I teach fifth grade. And so as a fifth grade teacher, we kind of are responsible for all the subjects. I know some, some teachers rotate classes and have a specialty, but in my class, I'm doing math, reading, writing, social studies, science, the whole shebang. One of our fifth grade writing units is journalism. And so we have a curriculum, we have, you know, a unit of study where they're, they're, you know, being exposed to different types of journalism. They write a current events article by observing things that are happening around the school. You know, we, we go with our, our steno pads out to the playground and observe, the, observe the kindergartners at, at play and see what the issues are and say like, Oh, you've got another fight over the sidewalk chalk or, you know, something like that. And they're, they're writing the, an article. And then uh, we move into kind of more in-depth reporting about um, not just like a current event type article, but like looking at a, a problem that's been maybe going on for a long time or a problem that is is developing like climate change or pollution in our area or think some, something bigger like that, not just something that just happened on the playground. Following all the lessons that we normally would do, but then asking the question, well, how can we take what we're doing in the classroom and grow a, a larger audience so that m me as their teacher is not the only one who's going to be reading this final product? You know, that's a simple question that teachers can ask is, you know, we've got a couple to consider. Who can they learn from? 
And so for in this case, we, we reached out to the Detroit News, the Detroit Free Press. One of the central office administrators in our own district had previously won an Emmy for her television reporting. Oh, wow. So we, we had her come in. She brought her trophy, <laughs> which was the highlight I still remember, you know, getting to hold an Emmy. And, you know, we were learning from all of these people who are doing it in their everyday careers. Then we said, you know what, we're not just going to publish classroom newspaper. We're going to take these stories and create a podcast. And I have to say, I was inspired by Mr. Rondo's four fourth graders who had originally started the podcast in our school and the fifth graders saw that and wanted to kind of, you know, add on and become uh, world famous also. So we took the stories that they wrote and then wondered, well, what's the difference between print media and spoken word or audio media? And we reached out to uh, the Pulitzer Center for education and got to actually talk with a couple of different journalists, one of which is uh, still on NPR. In, behind the science desk, Rebecca Hersher, and she was able to Skype with us and talk about the differences and talk about what it what it takes to compose a compelling audio storytelling. And then they took so they took those stories that they had been working on and turned them into a podcast script. And we launched what is now known as the Fifth Grade Futurists Podcast, mm -hmm. and that has lived on. Uh, we're in our third season now, and the topics have changed, but we still use that as a platform to reach a wider audience, and it makes it real. It makes it exciting and you know it's something where yes it's in our curriculum but there there's more that you can do with it to make it meaningful this podcast is a proud member of the teach better podcast network better today better tomorrow and the podcast to get you there you can find out more at teachbetter.com slash podcast now let's get back to the episode i want to talk about that piece about going beyond the classroom and, and finding an authentic audience i believe is what you stated so what are some ways that you are having your students share out work to additional people beyond the classroom walls? So we have many different examples of this. And a lot of times we start small and starting small can be as simple as inviting the classroom next door into your, into your classroom on a day where you're doing some presentations or instead of everyone just sitting for a presentation, group kids up from another class and let them pitch their ideas back and forth to get that authentic feedback. It can also be leveraging technology and using an app like Flipgrid. One time we were doing this project with nonfiction writing, and we all had to write a book about the Civil War. So students kind of narrated it, made it an audio book, and then uploaded that to Flipgrid. And we sent that to other schools across the district. And the other schools added theirs. And what was really cool is my email that night was just because I had it set. So like all the new comments were like coming to my email. And at eight, nine, 10 o'clock at night, like I'm getting like a flurry of emails of kids from all around the district, like actually reading each other's books and leaving video comments, which again, just makes it more exciting knowing that somebody else besides just us are reading it, that somebody could leave a comment on it and things like that. So those are some small ways. Other ways are to have like big uh, showcases where we've had big projects where we set up kids set up in like the cafeteria and then we invite central office members, the community and local people, maybe experts who we've connected with to hear their projects. And then going even bigger, like Grace mentioned, we both have classroom podcasts and I started mine, yeah, three years ago. And really just like, I kept saying like, you know, people around the world are going to listen to this. And I kind of kept expecting to see like 12 downloads from Troy, Michigan, but <laughs> looking at it now, like there's almost 4,000 listens and on Anchor, which we use, it tracks the location. It's We've reached 34 different countries, which is like not something I planned or anticipated. But when you take that jump, sometimes really amazing things can happen. And what a powerful experience that is for the kids to see that, you know, they put this content out and 34 different countries is, you know, they're consuming that. I can only imagine what the reaction of your students are. It taps into that, you know, natural inclination that, that kids now have, you know, the desire to be YouTubers when they grow up or Twitch streamers and like, you know, they want to be heard by somebody. And, you know, the classroom, te the relationship with the classroom teacher is so important. And that's another way that teachers are experts already. But yeah, when you can say like, you know, not only are you going to be doing this project to learn about this uh, event or this this topic, but then also we're going to be sharing it with these people. It just makes it real. Yeah. You talked about myth busting and I don't want to take us off the rails of this topic, but I'm just kind of going in and thinking about some teacher reactions or admin reactions to listening to the project-based learning. How do you guys grade these projects and 
and how do you assess the learning that's occurring? Well, as fourth grade teachers, we can, fourth and fifth grade teachers, our school is gradeless as far as letters until the middle school, which is helpful in a way. But also it's like, you know, reading a lot of studies on what students retain from the traditional assessments. I read a study one time and I, I won't get it verbatim, but they took like valedictorians, you know, got 100% on their multiple choice finals. And then in September of the next year, gave them the same tests and they were getting like 40, 50%, like not passing grades. So in that measure, like, is that truly learning or is it truly learning for a short period of time? Or like, where is that? So when we think about projects and assessing it, it's kind of like, you know, when they are doing all this preparation, when they have to present, that is the learning that sticks with them. And I always ask, you know, when we start a project in fourth grade, I'll go and ask the fifth graders, be like, hey, we just started this project. Do you remember that from last year? And kind of like, not quiz them on the spot, but they'll, you know, I'll ask them some questions, but oh yeah, I remember this, this and this, we learned about this person. So it's not really like statistical data, but just through informal things, I truly believe we both do that. When students are that engaged in their learning, it's more meaningful, it sticks. And then we are able to go through and we have standards based grading. So yep. like able to see based on their product, if they understand met standards. Mm -hmm. I think, I mean, the, the most useful type of feedback for students is more narrative anyway, and like telling them about what they did well and having a conversation. One of the things that Zach and I did early in our like teaching together is we tried to develop alternative assessments for all of our science units. So instead of having those multiple choice, you know, quizzes that come with the, the binders and, and, you know, just making Xerox copies, we tried to develop a hands-on approach saying like, can you show me this? You know, if you ask kids to show what they've learned in a different way, you you can often be surprised at how much more they know than a t even a test would capture. Or, um, you know, the, you can get to how they remembered it or misconceptions you can clear up through those conversations. And you can learn a lot more about what students know from those performance-based assessments than you can from paper pencil. And that's probably a bigger conversation, right? As far as you're talking about changing the role of education or how we implement things and standards-based grading is another form of that, um, that I think we can all agree that, you know, the feedback that's provided to our students is much greater than an A, B, C, or F, right? I mean, but yeah. I don't want to, I don't know if I want to go down that rabbit hole with you gentlemen, but I think we're all on the <laughs> same page of understanding what the true meaning of assessment for our students. Let's talk about the summer program, right? You you hinted at it, Grayson. You guys are working on a program this summer that's implementing project-based learning, but it's going beyond your comfort level, right? I mean, you've been working in the elementary stages, but now you're expanding and you're going into middle school and high school and seeing great success. Um, Zach, you talked about coding and how you're learning a great deal of about coding from your students, and I think that's just an amazing visual aid of like this new model, right? Of the teacher doesn't have to know absolutely everything about the subject matter that you can be in that process with your students and still see success and growth. And I'm just imagining what they're producing right now. So will you share just a little bit about the program and what you all are doing? Yeah, we're both a part of this program called the Oakland Youth Innovation Lab. And it's a two week summer program in which students came with kind of a passion. They took an, an interest survey uh, based on what they're most interested in. And the entire program, which spans across multiple different sites for sixth or 12th graders, is based on the driving question of how can we use our voices to create a more just society hmm. or a more just world? So in doing that, like I got paired up with, or I got put in the group with coding and technology. And that is not to say I'm an expert coder. So going into this, I'm working with the sixth through 12th graders who vary in expertise, but some of them are like, building apps that will be on the app store in the next six months right now and are doing things to, to create something and to solve a problem. So my initial thought was it was going to be tough to take coding and meet that driving question. But some of the things that have come up is uh, the one group I was talking about who will have an app, I believe on the app store is there, they just changed your name. It's called the schedule bot or the time bot where they realize that their problem as high schoolers is they have so many things on their plate and going home from school and having a set amount of time. So their app, they program in say like math homework and their estimated amount of time, 45 minutes. Then they can plug in like mowing the lawn, 30 minutes. And this program will like put them in order throughout their day. 
And as they are done with it, they can swipe it off the list and check. It's it's really like amazing of what, what they are coming up with. Another group is very interested in gaming. So we got some Raspberry Pis. They're, mm-hmm. We're downloading retro gaming. And their idea is to program these things, to have these retro games that are functional and to donate them to a children's hospital nearby. So they're using the knowledge they're gaining to provide entertainment for people who can use it. So it's it's been really, really eye-opening working with an older group, seeing the independence and also just seeing what happens when you let students work on their passions and you kind of help them with also help them by connecting them with experts, bringing people in, but also getting out of the way and letting them create. And one thing about this program is the very first meeting we had to talk about it, they were kind of like, we weren't in it yet. They were explaining it, trying to get people to apply. And one thing they said is like, this is the part of teaching we all went into this profession for, where we're not tied to homework. We're not tied to tests. We're not tied to lessons. We're there to help students who are passionate and help them create. So it's been an awesome experience. I'm going to let Grayson share what he's been working with. Yeah, it's interesting. I invited a a teacher friend of mine to come and observe because he was actually moving from the elementary level to the middle school level in the coming school year. And we were talking about grades and he's like, yeah, I'm not sure how it's going to be to go back to the system, you know, from standards based grading to letter grading. And I said, well, look at all of these kids. We have 100 100 students who are giving up two weeks of their summer to come in and do something that's going to answer that question of how how can we connect our passions and our voice to create a more just society? They're here because they feel like they're making a difference. And, um, you know, it's not because they're getting a grade or because they're getting, you know, honors credit or, you know, a resume builder. It's because they get to work on something that they're passionate about. They get to meet new people from, it's not just our school district, from neighboring school districts in our county. And just, it's, it's, it's been a blast. And like Zach said, like, this is the stuff that, you know, gets teachers out of bed in the morning and get ready, getting ready to go back to school. It's not to teach about you know, the uh, Toledo war between Michigan and Ohio, or to, you know, teach all of the, you know, the waypoints in history of the transcontinental railroad being built. It's about, about seeing kids get excited about learning and actually allowing them to make a difference in the world because we need more of that. Yeah. I'm so encouraged with what you guys are putting in place in your classrooms, in your school. And I know we always say that every person within the world of education is a leader. And I know that you guys are making a great impact. You may not have a title of administrator, but I know that you both are making huge impact, not only on your campus, but around the world, um, especially with your book. So for those who are listening and are wanting to enhance their impact as a educator, as a leader, what is something that they may do tomorrow or next week? I think of teacher leadership, like you said, as, as everyone in education, you know, everyone inside of a school building is an expert in some little niche of education. And there are so many teachers at our school that are have been so highly trained in like our ELA units and like being able to learn from them in professional development and them stepping up and sharing their knowledge at meetings or people, some people are really passionate about math and have done extensive like math recovery trainings. So it's kind of just like taking what you are an expert at and as teachers we must declare that we are experts because there's enough negativity about education out there and taking your expertise and sharing it with those um, within your setting and helping in any way you can to further the profession it's it's a team sport it's not a competition sport in education it's what i believe and i'll echo that too i think it's not only those academic based passions which yeah we all have our fortes but it's the personal passions too we have a teacher at our school who loves gardening and over the last two years has built a, uh, you know, a garden on some uh, otherwise barren land on our school property and gotten our, you know, our um, special ed students linked up with some general ed students and working together in that garden. I remember back to my elementary days and I had a teacher who was passionate about chess. He taught me chess. He actually came to my house and uh, hooked up my first uh, computer for me too, back in, that would have been 1990 probably. And um, I had another teacher who loved space. I remember she had gone to NASA and like was up, you know, up in the vomit comet doing the zero G simulation. And oddly, she also liked spiders and she had a pet tarantula in the class. So kids will remember the things that you are excited about. So be your authentic self, um, bring your own passions into the classroom. And like Zach said, find ways to connect what you care about to what you already are teaching. And kids will 
kids will latch on to that. I think it encourages them to feed their passions as well. Those are great examples and pieces of advice. Gentlemen, you are such a wealth of information, and I love the content that you're putting out also on social media. So how can folks connect with you um, to learn about more of what you're doing? Yeah, I'm on Twitter at at Mr. Rondo, and that's R-O-N-D-O-T, silent T. Um, on Instagram, at Zach Rondo, and have a blog, ZachRondo.com, that hopefully this school year I'll be adding more to. Yeah, we are definitely on social media. My Twitter handle is gmckinney 2 and that is also the name I use on Clubhouse, which is another great uh, professional development app. If you're not on Clubhouse yet, definitely check it out this coming school year. And then um, we also set up an Instagram account for our book. Our book has followers. <laughs> yes, and that is, that is uh, Expert Effect EDU on Instagram. Well, yes, I'm one of the followers on Instagram. So love the content you gentlemen are putting out. And wow, I mean, I'm, I'm going to have to go back into my notes and process everything about project-based learning and um, all the wonderful things that you, you discussed today. So I just want to say thank you so much for providing such wisdom to our listeners today. Thank you, Josh. It's an honor to be on your podcast. Thank you so much. 